This is the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter, 2022. Welcome to Lesson 8, Jesus the Mediator of the New Covenant, ready for teaching on February 19. It's from the series In These Last Days, The Message of Hebrews. The author is Dr. Felix Cortez, Associate Professor of New Testament Literature in the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary at Andrews University. And I'm your reader for today, Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, February 12. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that not only did Jesus come and live and die, but he became our mediator in heaven. And we know that as we come to you through him, that you hear us, that you supply your Holy Spirit to help us with our daily lives, but also with the understanding of your word. And as we open your word, your law this week, as we look at what you are telling us in the book of Hebrews, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide and bless each one of us. And particularly today, I'd like to pray for people in Lagos in Nigeria or Uruguay at Montevideo or Miami in Florida or Broome in Western Australia or the United Arab Emirates where people listen and Munich in Germany. As people listen to your word in these lessons, I pray that your spirit will guide and bless that each of us may come closer to the lovely Jesus who provided his life for our salvation. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 6. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. Let's read that again, Hebrews 8 verse 6. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises. By living a perfect life and then by dying in our place, Jesus mediated a new, better covenant between us and God. Through his death, Jesus cancelled the penalty of death that our trespasses demanded and made possible the new covenant. This truth is explained in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 to 10, which identifies Jesus as having manifested the perfect obedience required by the covenant. It references Psalm 40, referring to the Messiah's desire to render to God total obedience. As we read in Psalm 40, verses 7 and 8, Behold, I have come in the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. In the original context, this phrase we read in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 460, to do your will, described moral obedience to the will of God. The author of Hebrews uses the phrase to show that the sacrifice of Christ fulfilled the will of God in providing an acceptable atonement which the animal sacrifices had not provided. End of quote. For Paul, this psalm acquired special significance with the incarnation of Jesus. Jesus embodied the obedience of the new covenant. He is our example. We have been saved, not only because of his death, but also because of his perfect obedience. Sunday, February 13, The Need of a New Covenant Read Hebrews chapter 7, verses 11 to 19. Why was a new covenant needed? Hebrews 7, beginning at verse 11, Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, 
for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek, and not be called according to the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, of necessity there is also a change of the law. For he, of whom these things are spoken, belongs to another tribe, from whom no man has officiated at the altar." For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood, and it is yet far more evident if, in the likeness of Melchizedek, there arises another priest, who has come, not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness, for the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. According to Hebrews, the fact that Jesus was appointed priest according to the order of Melchizedek implied that a new covenant had been inaugurated. The Old Covenant had been given on the basis of the Levitical priesthood, as we read in verse 11. The Levitical priests acted as mediators between God and Israel, and the law excluded anyone else from the priesthood. The author concludes, then, that a change of priesthood implies a change of the law of the priesthood, as well as the change of the covenant, and we saw that in verses 12, 18, and 19. The issue with the old covenant was that it could not provide perfection. We saw that in verse 11. Paul is talking about the Levitical priesthood and its ministry, or sacrifices and feasts, etc., The animal sacrifices offered through them could not provide true total cleansing from sin or access to God. We read in Hebrews 10, 1-4, For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered." For the worshippers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. And Hebrews 9, verses 13 and 14. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the fresh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And Hebrews ten nineteen to 23 Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. The fact that a new covenant was necessary does not mean that God was unfair with Israel when he gave them the old covenant. The Levitical ministry and the services of the tabernacle were designed to protect them from idolatry and also to point them to Jesus' future ministry. Hebrews stresses that the sacrifices were a shadow of good things to come in Hebrews 10.1. By pointing them to Jesus, the sacrifices should have helped the people put their hope and faith in the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John 1.29, and will compare that with Isaiah Chapter 53, one of my favourite chapters in the Scriptures. Let's read it right through. Isaiah 53, beginning at verse 1. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? 
for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground he has no form of comeliness, and when we see him there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken." and they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labour of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. This is the same point that Paul makes when he says that the law was our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith in Galatians 3.24, or that, as it says in Romans 10.4, Christ is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. In other words, even the Ten Commandments, as good and perfect as they are, cannot provide salvation as you read in Romans 3, 20 to 28. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law, and Romans seven twelve to 14 Therefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. They provide a perfect standard of righteousness, but they do not provide righteousness any more than looking in a mirror can erase the wrinkles of age. For perfect righteousness, we need Jesus as our substitute. And so to finish today, why can't the law save us? After all, if we keep all the commandments, and keep them well, even flawlessly, why shouldn't that save us?
Monday, February 19, New and Renewed Compare Hebrews 8, verses 10 to 12, with Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 to 6, Deuteronomy 30, verses 11 to 14, and Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34. What does this teach us about the nature of the new covenant? First of all, Hebrews 8, beginning at verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbour, and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. And Deuteronomy 6, beginning at verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. And Deuteronomy 30, beginning at verse 11, for this commandment which I command you today is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, Who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that you may do it. And Jeremiah 31, beginning at verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds, and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbour and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more." The promise of a new covenant in Hebrews refers back to Jeremiah. According to Jeremiah, God's promise of a new covenant was, in fact, a renewal of the covenant that he had first made with Israel through Moses, as we've just read in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34. It could be argued, then, that Jeremiah 31 was not strictly speaking of a new covenant, but of a renewal of the original covenant with Israel. In fact, the Hebrew word for new, hadasha, can have both the sense of renew and brand new. The issue with the old covenant was that the people broke it, as we read in Hebrews 8, verses 8 and 9. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. The covenant was not faulty. The people were. If Israel had seen through the symbols to the coming Messiah and put their faith in him, the covenant would not have been broken. Yet, to be fair, there were many believers throughout Israelite history in whom the purposes of the covenant were fulfilled and who had the law in their hearts, as we read in these verses. Psalm 37, verse 31, The law of his God is in his heart, none of his steps shall slide. And Psalm 40, verse 8, I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. And Psalm 119, verse 11, Your word I have hidden in my heart, that I might not sin against you. And Isaiah 51, verse 7, Listen to me, you who know righteousness, you people in whose heart is my law. Do not fear the reproach of men, nor be afraid of their insults. 
While the new covenant is a renewal of the old covenant, there is a sense in which it is indeed new. Jeremiah's promise of a new covenant did not simply envision a renewal of the conditions that existed before the exile, which had been broken and renewed several times because the nation had lapsed several times into apostasy. And that's because the people were simply unwilling to keep up their end of the covenant with God, as we read in Jeremiah 13.23. Can the Ethiopian change his skin, or the leopard its spots? Then may you do good who are accustomed to do evil. Instead, God promised to do a new thing in Jeremiah 31 verse 22. The covenant would not be like the covenant that God had made with their fathers in Jeremiah 31 32. Because of the unfaithfulness of the people, the promises that God made under the Mosaic covenant were never fulfilled. Now, in virtue of the guarantee given by the Son, in Hebrews 7.22, by so much more Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant, God would fulfil the purposes of his covenant. God did not change his law or lower his standards. Instead, he sent his Son as a guarantee of the covenant promises, as you read in Hebrews 7.22. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. And Hebrews 6, verses 18 to 20, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, who have fled to refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. This is why this covenant does not have curses. It has only blessings, because Jesus fulfilled it perfectly, becoming a curse for us, as we read in Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And so to finish today, read 2 Timothy 2.13. What can we learn from God's faithfulness to his people and to his plans as we consider our relationships with others and our plans? 2 Timothy 2 verse 13. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Tuesday, February 15. The New Covenant has a better mediator. Read Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 to 6. Why is Jesus a better mediator of the covenant? Hebrews 8, beginning at verse 1. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. The Greek term mesites, M-E-S-I-T-E-S, -E -E mediator, derives from misos, middle, and denotes the one who walks or stands in the middle. It was a technical term that referred to a person who fulfilled one or more of the following functions. 1. An arbiter between two or more parties. 
2. A negotiator or business broker. 3. A witness in the legal sense of the word. or 4. One who stands as a surety and thus guarantees the execution of an agreement. The English term mediator is too narrow a translation for Mesites in Hebrews because it focuses only on the first two or three uses of the Greek term. Hebrews, however, emphasises the fourth function. Jesus is not conceived of as mediator in the sense that he settles a dispute between the Father and humans, or as a peacemaker who reconciles parties in disaffection, or as a witness who certifies the existence of a contract or its satisfaction. Instead, as Hebrews explains, Jesus is the guarantor or surety of the new covenant in Hebrews 7 verse 22. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. In Hebrews, the term mediator is equivalent to guarantor. He guarantees that the covenant promises will be fulfilled. Christ's death makes the institution of the new covenant possible because it satisfies the claims of the first covenant with Israel and even with the first humans in Eden, which had been broken, as you read in Hebrews 9, verses 15 to 22. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For, when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no remission. In this sense, Jesus is the guarantor who took upon himself all the legal obligations of the covenant that had been broken. In another sense, Jesus' exaltation in heaven guarantees that God's promises to human beings will be fulfilled, as we read in Hebrews 6, 19 and 20. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Jesus guarantees the covenant because he has shown that God's promises are true. By resurrecting Jesus and seating him at his right hand, the Father has shown that he will resurrect us and also bring us to him. Jesus is a greater mediator than Moses because he ministers in the heavenly sanctuary and has offered himself as a perfect sacrifice for us, as we read in our text today in Hebrews 8 verses 1 to 5. And we also read this in Hebrews 10 verses 5 to 10. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book it is written of me, To do your will, O God. Previously saying, Sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. 
Moses' face reflected the glory of God, as he read in Exodus 34:29 to 35. So we begin at verse 29. Now it was so, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand, when he had come down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. So when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. Then Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward all the people of Israel came near, and he gave them as commandments all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And he would come out and speak to the children of Israel whatever had been commanded. And whenever the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone, then Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. But Jesus is the glory of God, as we read in Hebrews 1, three, who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And John 1 and verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Moses spoke with God face to face. We read in Exodus 33:11, so the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend, and he would return to the camp. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. But Jesus is God's word personified, as you read in Hebrews 4, verses 12 and 13. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. And John 1 verses 1 to 3, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. And again verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so to finish today, yes, Christ has satisfied the demands of the covenant for obedience. In this light, what is the role of obedience in our life, and why is it still so important? Wednesday, February 16. The New Covenant has better promises. We may be tempted to think that the New Covenant has better promises in the sense that it has greater rewards than the Old Covenant had. A heavenly homeland, eternal life, etc. The truth is that God offered the same rewards to Old Testament believers as he has offered to us. As you read in Hebrews 11, verse 10, For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And verses 13 to 16, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the 
earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. In Hebrews 8 verse 6, the better promises refer to different kinds of promises. Hebrews 8 verse 6, But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. The better promises refers to different kinds of promises. The covenant between God and Israel was a formal exchange of promises between God and Israel. God took the initiative and delivered Israel from Egypt and promised to lead them into the promised land. Compare Exodus 24, 1-8 and Hebrews 10, 5-10. What are the similarities and differences between these two promises? Exodus chapter 24, verses 1 to 8. Now he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people go up with him. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments, and all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has said we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord, and he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain, and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. Then he sent young men of the children of Israel, who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half the blood and put it in basins, and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, All that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, This is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you, according to all these words. And we compare that with Hebrews 10, verses 5 to 10. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Previously saying, Sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. The covenant between God and Israel was ratified with blood. This blood was sprinkled both over and beneath the altar. The people of Israel promised to obey all that the Lord had spoken. As we read in Steps to Christ, page 62, The condition of eternal life is now just what it always has been, just what it was in paradise before the fall of our first parents. Perfect obedience to the law of God, perfect righteousness. If eternal life were granted on any condition short of this, then the happiness of the whole universe would be imperiled. The way would be open for sin, with all its train of woe and misery, to be immortalized. End of quote. God satisfies the absolute demand of the new covenant for us because he gave his own son to come and live a perfect life so that the promises of the covenant might be fulfilled in him and then offered to us by faith in Jesus. Jesus' obedience guarantees the covenant promises, as we read in Hebrews 7.22, by so much more Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. It first requires that God give him the blessings of the covenant, which are then given to us. 
Indeed, those who are in Christ will enjoy those promises with Him. Second, God gives us His Holy Spirit to empower us to fulfil His law. And so to finish today, Christ has satisfied the demands of the covenant. Therefore, the fulfilment of God's promises to us is not in doubt. How does this help you understand the meaning of 2 Corinthians 1, 20-22? What wonderful hope is found here for us? 2 Corinthians 1, beginning at verse 20. For all the promises of God in Him are yes, and in Him amen to the glory of God through us. Now He who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Thursday, February 17. The New Covenant has solved the problem of the heart. Compare the New Covenant promises of Jeremiah 31.33 and Ezekiel 36 verses 26 to 27. How are they related? Jeremiah 31 beginning at verse 33. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And Ezekiel 36, beginning at verse 26, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. The first covenant document was written by God on tablets of stone and was deposited in the Ark of the Covenant as an important witness to God's covenant with his people, as we read in Exodus 31.18. And when he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone, written with the finger of God. In Deuteronomy 10, beginning at verse 1, At that time the Lord said to me, Hew for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and come up to me on the mountain and make yourself an ark of wood, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke, and you shall put them in the ark. So I made an ark of acacia wood, hewed two tablets of stone like the first, and went up the mountain, having the two tablets in my hand. And he wrote on the tablets according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments, which the Lord had spoken to you in the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And the Lord gave them to me. Documents written in stone, however, could be broken, and scrolls, as Jeremiah had experienced, could be cut up and burned. And we read that in Jeremiah 36.23, and it happened when Jehudai had read three or four columns that the king cut it with the scribe's knife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until all the scroll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. But in the New Covenant, God now will write his law in the hearts of the people. The heart refers to the mind, the organ of memory and understanding, as you read in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15, And I will give you shepherds according to my heart, who will feed you with knowledge and understanding, in Deuteronomy 29, verse 4. Yet the Lord has not given you a heart to perceive, and eyes to see, and ears to hear, to this very day and especially to the place where conscious decisions are made, as we read in Jeremiah 3, verse 10. And yet for all this her treacherous sister Judah has not turned to me with her whole heart, but in pretense, says the Lord in Jeremiah 29, and verse 13. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. This promise did not simply secure access to and knowledge of the law for everyone. It also, and more important, was to bring about a change in the heart of the nation. 
The problem of Israel was that their sin was engraved with a pen of iron, with a point of diamond, on the tablet of the heart, as it reads in Jeremiah 17, verse 1. They had a stubborn heart. Jeremiah 13, 10, This evil people who refuse to hear my words, who follow the dictates of their hearts, and walk after other gods to serve them and worship them, shall be just like this sash, which is profitable for nothing. And Jeremiah 23, 17. They continually say to those who despise me, The Lord has said, You shall have peace. And to everyone who walks according to the dictates of his own heart, they say, No evil shall come upon you. Therefore, it was impossible for them to do the right thing, as you read in Jeremiah 13.23. Can the Ethiopian change his skin, or the leopard his spots? Then may you also do good who are accustomed to do evil. Jeremiah did not announce a change in the law, because the problem of Israel was not the law, but the heart. God wanted Israel's faithfulness to be a grateful response to what he had done for them. Thus, he gave the Ten Commandments to them with a historical prologue, expressing his love and care for them, as we read in Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. God wanted Israel to obey his laws as an acknowledgement that he wanted the best for them, a truth revealed in their great deliverance from Egypt. Their obedience was to be an expression of gratitude, a manifestation of the reality of their relationship. The same is true today for us. Jesus' love and care in dying for us is the prologue of the new covenant, as you read in Luke 22, verse 20. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. True obedience comes from the heart as an expression of love, as you read in Matthew 22, verses 34 to 40. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment of the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This love is the distinguishing mark of the presence of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. God pours his love on us through his Spirit, as you read in Romans 5.5. 5. Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, who was given to us. The reception of whom is expressed by love, as we read in Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. So to finish the day. If ancient Israel was to love God, even without the understanding of Christ's death, why shouldn't we love God even more than they did? How does obedience make manifest the reality of that love? Friday, February 18. From the book Steps to Christ, my favourite little book, page 60, 64 and 65, we read, If our hearts are renewed in the likeness of God, if the divine love is implanted in the soul, will not the law of God be carried out in the life? When the principle of love is implanted in the heart, when man is renewed after the image of him that created him, the new covenant promise is fulfilled of Hebrews 10.16. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And, if the law is written in the heart, will it not shape the life? 
Obedience, the service and allegiance of love, is the true sign of discipleship. Thus the scripture says, This is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. 1 John 5 verse 3 and chapter 2 verse 4. Instead of releasing man from obedience, it is faith and faith only that makes us partakers of the grace of Christ, which enables us to render obedience. The closer you come to Jesus, the more faulty you will appear in your own eyes, for your vision will be clearer and your imperfections will be seen in broad and distinct contrast to his perfect nature. This is evidence that Satan's delusions have lost their power, that the vivifying influence of the Spirit of God is arousing you. No deep-seated love for Jesus can dwell in the heart that does not realise its own sinfulness. The soul that is transformed by the grace of Christ will admire his divine character, but if we do not see our own moral deformity, it is unmistakable evidence that we have not had a view of the beauty and excellence of Christ. End of quote. And that brings us to our two discussion questions for this week. One, think about the statements of Ellen G. White above. What does the fact that the closer we come to Christ, the more sinful we will appear in our own eyes tell us about how we must not let the realisation of our own defects cause us to give up faith in despair? And two, dwell more on the idea that the law is being written in our hearts. What does that mean for the spiritual life of a Christian? How could understanding and experiencing this truth help us avoid the kind of obedience that is really only legalism? Obedience that has been called in Hebrews 9.14, dead works. Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled Sabbath or Scholarship, and it's by Andrew McChesney. It was an offer the Seventh day Adventist girl could not refuse a full scholarship to study at a private, non Christian school. Malevolev grew up in an Adventist home and had been taught to remember God in all her decisions. She planned to enter Taiwan Adventist Academy when she finished sixth grade. Then recruiters from a private school showed up in her village and offered her a full scholarship. Tuition was high at Taiwan Adventist Academy and it would be difficult for her parents to afford it. They asked the girl to go to the private school. During summer vacation, Malevolev visited the school and saw she would be required to attend classes on Sabbath. She wouldn't be able to go to church to worship God. A conflict erupted within her. Should she accept the scholarship or keep the Sabbath? She knew she should choose the Sabbath. At the end of the summer, Malevolev's parents insisted she go to the private school. The girl felt dreadfully discouraged and she prayed fervently. God, help me, she prayed. Show me what to do. Taking courage, she spoke kindly but firmly to her parents. I want to go to Taiwan Adventist Academy, she said. I will not go to classes on Sabbath because I want to go to church. She explained her desire to remain faithful to God by keeping all Ten Commandments, including the fourth, remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy, Exodus 20 verse 8. I don't want to betray the truth taught by my grandfather, she said. Seeing the girl's determination, her parents allowed her to study at the Adventist Academy. Malevolev has studied for five years at the school and is in the 11th grade. I have wonderful teachers and classmates, and we are like a big family, she said. I have made many Christian friends. We have morning and evening worship together, we pray together, and we study together. I cherish every moment at the school. Malevolev is hopeful for the future. 
I know God will lead me and fulfill his wonderful plan for me, she said. When you need to make an important decision, believe in God and choose according to his will and pleasure. I encourage myself with Ecclesiastes 12.1 all the time. Now I am sharing my secret with you, and may God bless you. This mission story illustrates the following components of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's I Will Go strategic plan. Spiritual growth objective number seven, to help youth and young adults place God first and exemplify a biblical worldview. Learn more about the strategic plan at IWillGo2020.org. And I guess maybe you've had a similar experience. I know I did when I was a student. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind, and It Is Written. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. Remember, God is always faithful.